I am a neurologist in a psychiatrist's body or something like that. Uh, um, my practice is mainly focused on this integration between uh, neurology and psychiatry, which is a very, very difficult field because most psychiatric issues uh, we have thought about as being uh, immaterial or phenomenological or psychological. And, and really, we're learning a lot more about the brain. We're understanding sort of the molecular underpinnings of conditions that are ubiquitous, like stress. And I think that when we look at you know, some of the godfathers of original medicine, uh, as physicians, we're all faced with this question of uncertainty, right? And we're always worried about not having enough data, making the wrong diagnosis, uh, or not being up to date with the right treatments. And I want to talk to you today a little bit about how what we're learning about the biochemistry of conditions like stress leads to a better application, both clinically, uh, diagnostically, and therapeutically. So let's talk about stress, okay? It's a ubiquitous condition, but it's not just psychological, right? So everyone here should be familiar with the fact that stress uh, is a perceptual uh, event by the brain that triggers uh, a host of downstream metabolic factors, starting with the hippocampus and the hypothalamus, uh, in which corticotropin-releasing hormone is released. That then stimulates pituitary to make ACTH, and then the adrenals make cortisol. Uh, but in addition to that, we know that there's vasoconstrictive properties. All these are, are fight-or-flight systems that are initially adaptive for stress experience, but become maladaptive uh, with chronicity, right? And this concept that, that uh, cortisol is dysregulated uh, in stress conditions is something that was originally proposed by Charles Nemiroff, uh, who's at Emory, he's now at, at University of Miami. But think of it this way. So the normal feedback mechanisms, if you have a fight or flight system in which you experience a stressful event, it, it causes you to release corticotropin-releasing hormone, ultimately it releases cortisol, there are these feedback receptors uh, that exist uh, in the hypothalamus and the limbic system that bind cortisol and literally turn off the danger signal, okay? And then the flight or fight, you know, fear is moved biologically and you regenerate whatever's happened metabolically. In certain patients with vulnerabilities uh, or with persistent stress, those feedback loops become disinhibited, meaning that the normal feedback inhibition that cortisol has to turn that HPA axis system off reverberates, it continues, it continually producing a state of fight or flight even when the initial noxious stimuli has been removed, okay? So just we know that the adaptive aspects of threat uh, work when you were essentially in a situation that the danger was acute and then after it was acute, you recovered from that. But now we live in a society where we're at a persistent low level of stress um, and that stress produces consequences that are not only psychological, but physiological and metabolic. And it's our understanding as integrative medicine doctors to really dive deeply into the, the, the molecular biology of the genetics and the epigenetics of how these uh, perturbations of chronic stress psychologically affect downstream systems like the cardiovascular system, the immune system, and of course the brain itself. So we know that we heard this term about epigenetics. We know that, that uh, you know, environmental experience affects the expression of genes. Um, there's even data that came out fairly recently that shows that the grandchildren survivors of Holocaust survivors have similar epigenetic changes in HPA axis genes uh, as their, not only their parents, but the, the original experiences of the Holocaust itself. So meaning that the people who survived the Holocaust uh, you can actually regulate or assess uh, the epigenetic expression of certain fight-or-flight cortisol genes. Their children actually have similar epigenetic expression, but now their grandchildren do as well. So the idea that, that memory could be so persistent into an effect generationally uh, shows us how impactful experience is on the expression of genes. Uh, and we have to kind of look at this sort of from the top down as well as the bottom up, right? So we want to look at this uh, experientially or existentially. Uh, I, I, I'm always, you know, concerned if we if we micromanage uh, patients. I'm not. I'm, I am a reductionist, by the way. I mean, I, I am. My research lives here, but I think if we 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 don't stay up here uh, in relationship content to our patients and and really understanding 
the wider issues about what patients are bringing with them along with their host of physical complaints, we may actually miss the boat in terms of understanding the relationship of psychological stress to alterations in, in the brain and neurochemistry. But we do know that, that early stress produces biological changes. It increases risk for developmental delay. Uh, it produces increased risk of metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, immune system dysfunction, and of course, obviously, major depression and PTSD, which are psychiatric diseases that are worsened by stress. So I think we can go back to Osler and say, even though we don't know a lot, one of the things that we do know for certain is that stress, persistent, prolonged, unmitigated stress, uh, is unhealthy and affects our entire system's biology. And we have to kind of unravel specifically what those pathways are, okay? So it's physiological, not only psychological. I want to show you some of the, the key genes that have been associated with PTSD, uh, as well as major depression. Uh, try to explain to you the relationship in 30 minutes between stress, the immune system, and brain biochemistry. Give you a little bit of a taste of epigenetics and how we can change the expression of these genes, really for an eye specifically on how, when you see a patient, you can identify which area of their body is being affected by stress so you're able to take an integrative holistic medicine approach as opposed to giving them just an SSRI or an antipsychotic drug. So I want you to live here for the rest of the half hour, okay? Uh, this is where I think most of the intracellular action is taking place. Uh, we know that genetics and environmental factors produce abnormalities in lipid mobilization. This may be one of the examples why a lot of the genes associated with Alzheimer's disease, such as APOE and ABCA7, have to do with abnormal uh, brain uh, phospholipid metabolism. Uh, we also know that rocadonic acid uh, provokes glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter that, that is involved in excitotoxicity. But even further downstream is here, okay, is that at the, ultimately we're talking about changes of ionic channels. And I lecture psychiatrists a lot, and I say to them, how many psychiatrists in this room, by the way, are there here today? Any? Wow, that's great. So I, I tell psychiatrists that you guys are cardiologists of the brain. And they say, what do you mean, cardiologists brain? So cardiologists, when they treat hypertension or arrhythmias, they're using drugs that are ion channel modulating drugs. When psychiatrists treat bipolar or schizophrenia or, or manic episodes, most of the anticonvulsant drugs modulate ion channels. So we need to understand the, the top-down effects of how sodium and calcium uh, affect the activity of neurons and glial cells to produce a hyper-excitable state correlating with the fight-or-flight response experientially. Okay, so that's where we're going to spend a little bit of time today talking about that. And in terms of the immune system in the brain, uh, a lot of you are talking about using ketones now. I've heard uh, a, lot of the, a lot of ketone euphoria, uh, which is good. I think I'm, I'm all in favor of ketones, but I think we need to understand a little bit about what we're doing when we're giving ketones in the brain. So when the immune system is activated uh, by either a true antigen or just by a viral uh, or even a psychological effect, it elevates gamma interferon and other, other interferons that change an enzyme called indolamine dioxygenase, IDO. Uh, is it responsible for converting tryptophan to either quinolonic acid or kyanic acid? Quinolonic acid is a neurotoxic uh, acid, and it actually acts on NMDA receptors to depolarize them and produce neurotoxicity. So the idea is that a hyperimmune activation produces neurodegeneration through many pathways, but this is one of the major pathways. And one of the current theories of how ketones may be anti-inflammatory is by changing the ratio of quinolinic acid to kyanic acid. You're actually increasing production of kyanic acid, which is a glutamate antagonist, and decreasing quinolinic acid. So always think of this as a, uh, a binary balance. We talk about, you know, it's, it's really the Goldilocks story, if you will. You know, suppressing the immune system is not a good idea, okay? We've tried that in conventional neurology. Uh, people have looked at using non-steroidals to prevent Alzheimer's disease, COX-2 inhibitors, gamma globulin. I mean, there's a, there's a host of agents we've tried to prevent progression of Alzheimer's disease based upon suppressing the immune system. That's not worked so well, okay? Now people are thinking, well, maybe we need to augment the immune system, okay? And actually, I'm gonna explain to you why it's not a binary concept when we get into glial cells in a few minutes.
Okay, so here's my challenge to you. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking to you about how we get from stress to either neuroplasticity or neurodegeneration in 15 words or less. Are you ready? Okay, so glutamate gets elevated as a result of psychological or physical trauma. It binds to various glutamate receptors, including the NMDA receptor. That increases calcium influx, which, as I told you earlier, produces depolarization of neurons. Uh, cortisol becomes elevated. That decreases the production of neurotrophic factors like BDNF. Uh, and ultimately what happens is that we are changing the behavior of both the mitochondria and the neuron. At the mitochondria, these active states of fight or flight are producing pro-apoptotic factors, okay? So they're depolarizing the mitochondria, just like the brain's being depolarized, to run away from the challenge. But guess what? That's called burnout, right? If you have continuous persistent activation of the mitochondria in response to perceived stress, the mitochondria can no longer keep up with the metabolic demand necessary for the fight or flight responses. So when you see patients with fatigue, uh, you're really looking at a mitochondrial symptom, okay? And we also know that stress affects, as we'll talk about, epigenetically the expression of certain genes. Uh, uh, John mentioned, you know, this concept of resilience, and that's why I'm so pleased uh, to meet a, a fellow neurologist here, uh, Dr. Bresden, who's gonna talk about not disease, but how to actually improve resilience and you know, these intrinsic pathways. So we're not looking at this just as a disease, but actually ways of promoting health and preventing disease. So how many people feel like they're here right now? Okay, that's a good sign if you're here. How many people feel like they know everything about genetics and epigenetics? Right, so we're all, listen, the reality is when it comes to brains, we're all here. Okay, and our goal as researchers is to help to really locate the neighborhood where we believe the, the problem actually is, help you identify that problem clinically, and give you the right solutions so that when you go back to your practice, you know, a week from now, that you actually have clinical tools that can help your patients. Otherwise, I don't want you to leave here thinking that that's where you are. Okay. So first of all, what are biomarkers, okay? You're all using biomarkers in your practice every day, okay? If you do a CBC, that's a biomarker. If you check iron levels, it's a biomarker. What we're now seeing, though, are biomarkers related to genetics and epigenetics, okay? So there's a lot of companies, uh, including the company I, I founded, just by way of disclosure, called Genomine, that we measure what are called SNPs. But SNPs are, you know, just part of the story. There's a growing uh, database of biomarkers that are helpful beyond SNPs that people need to be aware about. You heard about epigenetics. Uh, methylation is a epigenetic phenomena. Uh, when you methylate or demethylate, you are either turning a gene's expression on or off. And the other is something called histone acetylation. Uh, and that also modifies epigenetics. So how many of you uh, uh, know about the beneficial effects of indole 3 carbonyl or, or broccoli or, or, uh, or cauliflower as being tumor suppressive uh, agents, right? Well, they do that by histone deacetylation inhibition, okay? That's the primary mechanism of how they have anti-cancer effect is by actually blocking the expression of these histones that are pro-inflammatory. By the way, the same thing is true for how they work in the CNS. So uh, Dr. Zimmerman, who was at Hopkins, uh, did research showing that um, uh, cauliflower extract uh, with high amounts of indole 3 carbonyl was helpful for autistic symptoms. So we, we need to talk about not just genetics, but epigenetic expression as well, okay? What are the primary genes that we can look at for the HPA axis? One is the serotonin transporter gene. One is the MTHFR gene. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard about MTHFR. I'm not going to belabor that too long. The genes you've probably not heard about that relate to uh, resilience or PTSD risk are these three. FKBP5, which is responsible for cortisol uh, behavior. MER181, which is a gene that was discovered at McLean uh, that's associated with resilience. That is that you can actually look over thousands of patients. If a person has a MER181 variant, uh, they're more likely to be resilient to stress uh, less likely to be divorced, less likely to have substance abuse problems. So how is it a single mRNA, which is not even, it's not, it's not even a coded gene, it's actually something that regulates other genes, can affect the expression of so much uh, behavior is quite an amazing and unfolding story. Uh, another gene uh, is called corticotropin-releasing hormone gene. That affects the HPA axis. Uh, 
sleep genes, and again, we're gonna come back to whether you like it or not, understanding how ion channels are vital to nutritional pharmacology. This is something that I try to teach people, whether they're conventional psychiatrists or, um, or, or, or non-conventional psychiatrists, understanding the value of understanding ion channel dysfunction in psychiatry. So just a little bit about the serotonin transporter gene. Uh, again, it's epigenetics, that you can inherit a serotonin transporter gene. It doesn't mean that you're gonna get depressed or develop PTSD. What it does mean is that because of that gene, there's a higher risk of developing uh, a psychiatric symptom or syndrome if you have trauma as part of your medical history. Okay, so it's very important to understand this, this epigenetic concept. Genes are not deterministic in any way. They're probabilistic, okay? And the serotonin transport is one of the genes that's been well validated that if a person develops a variant in this gene, I'm sorry, inherits a variant of the gene, they have a high risk of developing uh, high rates of PTSD. The question is why? And the reason is why is that it looks like the serotonin transporter gene modulates cortisol, okay? Those individuals with short transporter alleles are more likely to have higher cortisol, especially after something called the dexamethasone suppression test, which normally should suppress cortisol production, okay? So the key thing to know about this is just remember that if you're a short transporter allele, okay, which is a gene that's tested for by uh, several companies, that predisposes your patient to higher levels of cortisol in response to trauma, okay? But guess what? We know that the methylation of the transporter gene also affects cortisol. That is, if we give patients methylating compounds like B12, folic acid, uh, glycine, B12, other methylation pathways, s methionine, we can actually suppress the adverse effects of the serotonin transporter gene on cortisol expression. In fact, they've done this both in humans and in animals. They've taken little mice, right, and they traumatize them, uh, and then they actually sacrifice the mice to see actually if they, you know, how much cortisol expression they have as a result of trauma. If you give those mice uh, high methylation-enriched diets before actually you traumatize them, and then you sacrifice them, the expression of those cortisol downstream effects have been attenuated significantly. So the methylation of uh, the diet actually is a, med a mediator uh, against sort of these adverse effects of gene expression, okay? And this is actually another study that shows the effects of the MTHFR gene. Uh, same story here. So a lot of us have MTHFR variants. In fact, almost two-thirds, actually 50% of you have at least one T allele in the MTHFR gene. About 10% of us, including myself, are homozygote for MTHFR. Now, if you have an MTHFR gene and your life is beautiful, okay, uh, you may never have any adverse effects to stress either physiologically or psychologically. But if you have uh, a uh, MTHFR variant, and you are exposed to environmental or physical stress, your risk of developing depression or PTSD or bipolar is significantly higher. Again, you have impaired methylation genetically, which is not able to suppress the normal epigenetic factors to reduce the abnormal effects of stress biologically, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go into the biochemistry too much of methylation here because of the interest of time, but I want you to understand that if you're a psychiatrist or even a, a, a lay person, serotonin is not the story about depression, okay? It's one of many factors involved in depression. We've had this sort of SSRI euphoria, if you will, about that everything that is depressed gets an SSRI, and somehow by increasing brain serotonin, that that's the answer to solutions of stress. Well, we know, in fact, that there's lots of other systems biology approaches where stress affects the immune system and the immune system affects the brain. Okay, coming back to ion channels. So ion channels are uh, really the gatekeepers, if you will, of neuronal excitation or, or inhibition. Okay, neurons either discharge or relax based upon sodium or calcium fluxing into the neuronal system. If a person has a gene variant in a sodium or calcium channel, they're more likely to have a condition where they have hyper uh, uh, excessive activity of neuronal uh, functionality. Anyone think of any clinical conditions in which you would, would expect where a patient has overactive depolarization of the brain clinically? Seizures. Seizures. 
Seizures is an example of, not, not ADHD necessarily, but yes. Bipolar is the second, yep. PTSD is three. Okay, don't call out this. You've got such an eager audience. Wow. Uh, so OCD does have an effect on sodium channels. We'll go more into glutamate for that. We can't cover the entire pharmacology of all these conditions. But yes, bipolar, 100% has been related to these ion channel dysfunctions, uh, as has uh, chronic pain, epilepsy, and migraines. Okay, And in fact, a lot of patients that you will see, what those patients have in common is lability and a paroxysmal nature of their symptoms. They, they are not like this. They're not like this. They go like this. Okay, so phenomenologically, you see that there's an instability, whether in their seizure history or in their mental history. So we can actually check these genes, and more importantly, we know that a lot of dietary supplements, like uh, the amino acid taurine, uh, is extremely neuroprotective by actually blocking sodium uh, and or calcium channels. So taurine has an anti-excitatory effect in the brain by reducing these channels. Resveratrol is another compound that's been looked at as having you know, longevity effects. It's also a sodium channel modulating agent in the brain. Okay, as is magnesium. So magnesium reduces excess of excitability, uh, and we know that it's that people that are magnesium deficient are at high risk of having stroke, uh, as well as migraine, particularly in women. Uh, magnesium pharmacologically stabilizes these calcium channels to prevent excessive depolarization. Um, so magnesium is an important thing to have. It's also important to know how magnesium works. So we go back to this sort of pathway here. We know that glutamate is the culprit in some ways, but not always, okay? We make glutamate out to be this horrible neurotransmitter. But guess what, guys? We need glutamate for synaptic transmission. If you block glutamate completely, you block cognition. And a classic example of that is anti-epileptic drugs like topiramate, which is a very potent glutamate antagonist. Patients will have complaint of side effects because it's such a glutamate suppressing agent that their cognition is slower. In fact, most psychiatric drugs, people complain about cognition being blunted because you're actually reducing glutamate activity. So the goal here is like the Goldilocks story. We want to actually only block excessive glutamate, but leave normal glutamate alone. Okay, and there's lots of tricks on how to do that. They're not really tricks, they're pharmacological agents. Look at essential fatty acids. Arachidonic acid is a glutamate agonist. Higher arachidonic acid, higher glutamate depolarization. If you switch the omega-3, omega-6 uh, balance and you reduce arachidonic acid, you can actually prevent excessive depolarization, and that may be the mechanism of how it works in bipolar and also in depression. By the way, though, arachidonic acid we think is bad, but breast milk is, is high in arachidonic acid because the developing brain requires this for uh, developing cognition. Okay, how many of you use N-acetylcysteine in your practice? So look like look the conventional psychiatrists that are, you know, here looking at that. People should be aware NAC uh, is a glutathione precursor, but also neurochemically is a glutamate antagonist. And what it does actually is promote a, a protein called GLT-1 which is responsible for glutamate reuptake in the synapse. So GLT-1 is a gene, I'm sorry, it's a protein encoded by a gene that if you have that, you have higher synaptic glutamate producing excessive excitotoxicity. And a lot of people, including Jeff Rostein at Hopkins, are looking at GLT-1 agonists to decrease synaptic glutamate. So n acetylcysteine is one of the compounds that reduces brain glutamate levels, okay? All right, what about the omega-3 fatty acids and arachidonic acid? Let's look down here a little bit because what happens with arachidonic acid is that you're taking phospholipids, right? And these phospholipids are required for normal neuronal function, okay? Neurons require boundaries, right? And these phospholipids pro provide boundaries for the cell. If you have any immune stimulus, you increase phospholipase, PLA2, which is a blood test you can get from a number of labs, uh, that, if it's elevated, is showing that you've actually increased the degradation of phospholipids, making more arachidonic acid and increasing inflammatory pathways. On the flip side of that uh, are these compounds called resolvins, which omega-3 fish oil actually is one of, that actually decreases inflammation and reduces it by blocking these pathways. Okay. Uh, 
just so you know, the conventional psychiatrist, uh, the use of omega-3 fish oil in psychiatry uh, through meta-analysis has shown that there's efficacy. Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all, nor is anything in nutritional medicine, which is why you know, we believe that looking at genetic biomarkers uh, is critical for your treatment. What about adaptogens? So adaptogens have multiple molecular mechanisms, and it behooves anyone who's using a botanical in their practice to understand what those molecular mechanisms are. So for a free lunch today, does anyone know what the primary mechanism of how we believe adaptogens, whether it's rhodiola, withania, uh, any of those, what is their primary cellular effect that is promoting resilience? They actually uh, uh, balance what are called heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins is a word that you should be familiar with because that's what we believe is one of the theories of how adaptogens incur cellular resilience, okay? At a biochemical level, they work uh, on two pathways, FKBP5 and MERB181. FKBP5 is a key gene factor. I told you earlier about in PTSD and stress situations, Patients have persistent elevation of cortisol because of lack of feedback inhibition, right? They have high elevated cortisol, inability to actually to process cortisol normally uh, and uh, recycle it. So FKBP5 is a gene that's been associated with PTSD, higher cortisol, and increased risk of psychiatric uh, diseases. And we know that adaptogens like withania from ashwagandha actually regulate FKBP5, okay? Now, here's one that you haven't heard about yet, MERV-181. Uh, by the way, Hermona Sarek uh, is really the godmom of the mRNA story, and she discovered mRNAs as being sort of the, the dark matter of DNA because mRNAs are responsible for how most of the genes get expressed. They are regulatory. They're not, they're not part of the actual expression of a gene. They're the, the, the security guards for genes. MERV-181 is a security guard for T cell activity, okay? So it either helps to increase or decrease T cell functionality. I highly recommend that people read up on MERV-181 uh, because we believe that various adaptogens are MERV-181 agonists, okay? That the way that they promote adaptogenic effects is by increasing MERV-181 activity. What's very interesting is that the major genes been associated with Alzheimer's disease uh, include, but are not exclusive of, APOE, CD33, TREM, and ABCA7. These are genes that are involved in phospholipid metabolism of the brain. They're involved in the neuroimmune axis, and they're also involved in brain metabolism. Why is that important? Well, when we now finally understand the network biology of dementia, and we understand that there's altered metabolism of phospholipids, this now helps us explain why compounds like uh, DHA uh, or phospholipids like GPC-choline uh, may actually prevent or, or reduce the progression of Alzheimer's disease by helping to restore normal phospholipid metabolism. CD33 is a gene discovered by Rudy Tanzi, uh, who I work with, by the way. He's uh, the head of genetics at, at, at Mass General. Uh, and he's elucidated that most of the genes associated with Alzheimer's disease are disrupting the neuroimmune axis. This is a key point, okay, that we now know that there's a smoking gun. We not only know that the immune system is, is overly active in degeneration, we also know the pathways specifically and why they're overactive. So you've all heard of, AB, of APOE. Uh, if you haven't, just be aware that if you have two alleles of the E4, that's the most validated risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Now, most conventional neurologists, present company excluded, have come out and said, look, don't recommend to patients to get E4 testing because we have nothing to offer them, which is really you being sold a bill of goods because the reality is we know a lot about how to modify and reduce risk of Alzheimer's based upon knowing who's at risk. So it makes no sense to put our, our heads in the sand and wait for the drug companies to come out with a drug because it's like waiting for Godot. You know, can we go? No, we're waiting for Godot. We know how to modify these risk factors through environmental uh, and epigenetic factors. Okay, and here's how we do it. Okay, this guy, the glial cell, we could spend literally hours talking about the brain immune system. Glial cells are not only the support for neurons, 
but actually are involved in synaptic neurotransmission. They're involved in neuroimmunity. They're involved in the release of these ion channels. So they have a huge amount of functionality or dysfunctionality. These glial cells come in four shapes, folks. They come either active, like active marines. They come at rest, like the couch potatoes. They're phagocytic, which means that they're responsible to eat up the, uh, the amyloid or tau that's building up in the brain, or they're senescent. And this is where we think the problem may be, is that the glial cells go from an, an active state to a senescent state, and they lose their capacity to either um, uh, attack antigens, whether it's HSV or Epstein-Barr virus or chronic infectious processes, or they're just turned on for no reason, just for stress, uh, and they become senescent, they become fatigued. So how do we actually get those glial cells back into action, right? We want them to actually be a good cop, not a bad cop, all right? So CD33 tells us how. So the CD33 gene tells us that if you have a normal variant of CD33, the glial cells are functioning normally. And in the CD33 variant, these glial cells are basically overactive they're literally eating up neurons, thinking that they're a foe, when in fact, these glial cells are supposed to be the good neighbor. They're supposed to be protecting the neuron. The neurons, neurons are like, like uh, they're, they're, you know, we think that they're the primary guy in the brain. It's the glial cells, okay? In fact, the glial cells feed neurons. Neurons get their, most of their nutrition from glial cells. And that's gonna be one of the secrets of how ketones work, by the way, is looking at glial cells donating to neurons ketones, okay? So here we are, again, this binary story. Either we're on this M1 side in which glial cells are overactivated, they're producing inflammatory pathways, gamma interferon, tumor necrosis factor, uh, IL-6, and they're producing neurotoxicity, uh, or we wanna actually get our glial cells into this M2 functionality in which they're promoting anti-inflammatory cytokines, suppressing the immune system, and also repairing tissue, okay? This is the challenge for us pharmacologically, whether we are nutritional doctors or conventional doctors, is to understand our patient's glial state uh, through genetics and epigenetics, and being able to not tip the balance in a way that is immunosuppressive, but not in a way where we actually uh, uh, produce damage. And this is what shows us what happens if we don't get it right. So a resting microglia uh, is supporting neurons, and activated microglia is producing all these pro-inflammatory cytokines, interferons, and they're producing de degeneration of the brain. Okay, now, the question is, what do we do? So first of all, what, what, do we, what have we learned about PET scans? And again, uh, Dr. Brez is gonna talk more about this soon. Uh, so I'm gonna try to finish up my talk very quickly for his, but we know that in Alzheimer's there's hypometabolism in the brain, right? There's reduced glucose utilization in the brain. That could be due to traumatic brain injury, insulin resistance, excessive immune activity. All we know is that the brain is hungry, it's starving for love, okay? We gotta give our brains more love, okay? So what do we do? Well, there are several things that we can do. Uh, one is that we know that phosphatidylserine and other phospholipids, uh, uh, phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylethanolamine are all compounds that rebuild phospholipids. Uh, DHA and resolvins actually are anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids. This is my favorite compound, CBD. We'll talk a little bit about cannabidiol, uh, but also ketones, okay? So we should probably have another talk just going to the pharmacology of each one of these things. But here's what we're trying to do. Okay, normally, normal healthy neurons utilize glucose. As the brain ages, the brain requires glial cells to donate ketones for their functionality. Okay, this is why we believe ketones are helpful for the brain. They're actually promoting the proper neuronal utilization of ATP. A lot less energy is required to break down a ketone than it is to break down a sugar. So in dementia patients, there is a dysfunctionality of neurons, decreased glial cell activity, and the brains need to use ketones as alternative fuel. Okay, what about marijuana? 
pay attention to CBD, forget THC. THC has, in my opinion, no pharmacological value whatsoever except to get high. Not against that, by the way, but if you really want to know the primary uh, compounds in marijuana, it's CBD. Okay, and just to summarize here, stress is a biological condition. It affects the HPA axis. Uh, it produces abnormal levels of cortisol. Adaptogens and uh, other technologies uh, can help lower patients' cortisol, but you have to realize that that patient is in a state of fight or flight. Cognitive dysfunction is uh, also related to inflammatory genes and high cortisol. Uh, rebuilding phospholipids using resolvins uh, and adaptogens. And last but not least is to pay attention to these ion channels because of overactivity of glutamate and reducing that through uh, magnesium, through taurine, uh, through omega-3 fish oil, uh, hormonal balance, things that actually stabilize the neurons uh, and reduce excitotoxicity are, are all ways of complementing each other so you can protect the brain from degeneration. Thank you very much. Thank you.